the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's devotion is based on the account of the golden calf recorded in Exodus 32. We'll consider the account in our devotion, and I encourage you to read the chapter after listening to this devotion. I love to teach this account to 5th through 8th graders. I love it for a number of reasons, and one of them is that it gives me an opportunity to teach them to see why they need a Savior. I always ask the ones I'm teaching if they have ever bowed down to an idol. I ask them if they have any other gods than the true God. I ask them if they've kept the first commandment. And every single time without fail, the answer is, No, I haven't bowed down to an idol. No, I don't have any other gods. Yes, I have kept the first commandment. To say this another way, I love teaching this account because it gives me a chance to reveal to them how perverse our sinful hearts are, and that what we need isn't to reform ourselves so our actions are better and more holy. What we need is someone who takes away our idolatry. This is important because from early on, we are bombarded from within and from around us a false view of the commandments. From the natural religion of our hearts, we hear this, If you do something bad, you should do something good, or else God is going to be mad at you. And then, when it is done, the sinful heart points to that outwardly shiny good thing and says, Boy, God sure is lucky I did that. He must really want to love me now. From around us, we hear many variations of a common theme that misunderstands God's commandments. This view sees our problem as mainly with sins, And if I can just try hard enough and commit myself enough, then I can stop those sins. What this view fails to relate and consider is that I sin because I am a sinner. I have a condition. What this view actually perpetuates is a thought that, yeah, I know I'm a sinner, but at least I've kept myself from those big sins. You know, like murderers and adulterers and drug addicts and homosexuals, God is pretty lucky to have someone who keeps himself from those horrible sins of society. But Exodus 32 and the rest of Scripture turns this foolishness upside down. From the moment of conception, we have an idolatry problem, a heart problem. It is a problem that is of no little or slight condition, It is so wicked and perverse it infects everything. Even after the gift of faith, the evil nature of that heart still shows itself and still worms its way into everything we do. Simply put, we are idolaters. We are first commandment breakers. We all have our own peculiar and comfortable gods before whom we bow down. A simple question to ask in order to reveal that all of this is true is this question. What am I afraid of? That question shows what it is that my heart clings to and from what persons or things I look for every good gift. That question reveals a heart that is steeped in evil. Want more proof? We grow impatient, and so we doubt God's promises. We tell everyone we can that God is good when life is good. But what happens when God takes that particular gift away? In fear and doubt, we cling to our own idols. To obey the first commandment is to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And whatever it is that you set your heart on and put your trust in and look for good things from, that is your idol. To obey the first commandment is to know no other comfort or confidence than the true God. You see, we have a heart problem. Our hearts stand gaping at something or someone else as if those things like wealth, ease, popularity, comfort, or recreation will bring us consolation. This was Israel's problem. Moses had gone up the mountain and now they were afraid. Every single one of God's actions prior to this should have led them to wait for Moses to lead them in patient trust. And so the unbelief in their hearts led them to ask of Aaron, Make us a God who will go before us and lead us. 
The perverse heart leads to perverse action. And God's anger rightly burns against them, so that the Lord tells Moses that he is going to destroy them. And here comes the most important reason I love this account, and why I love to teach it. It reveals Jesus. We see it in the words and actions of Moses, as well as the Holy Spirit's commentary on this account. In Psalm 106, we read that Moses stood in the breach between God and Israel so that the Lord's wrath would not destroy them. Moses interceded for the people by pleading the promise God had already made. In this, Moses does what he always does. He reveals Christ. Jesus is the one who has been confronted with every temptation you have, even those temptations to have other gods, to fear, love, and trust in other people and things other than God. Jesus has been subjected to everything you suffer and fear, and he obeyed perfectly for you. He kept the first commandment from beginning to end. Only Jesus' heart is pure when it comes to the first commandment. Jesus is also the one who stood in the breach between God and you and in his very own body absorbed all of God's wrath against you for all of your idolatry and all of the ways your idolatry shows itself in your words and your actions. In every way, at every time, in temptation and in happiness, in sorrow and in joy, in suffering and in dying, Jesus is no idolater, but feared, loved, and trusted in God above all things. And all this for you, all this in your place, all this to take away your idolatry, all this for your salvation. Because Jesus stood in the breach, you have a heavenly Father who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, our strength, the battle of good and evil, rages within and around us, and our ancient foe tempts us with his deceits and empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us up again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.